a Wikividi Documentaries production. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Enjoy. Semiramide Semiramide is an opera in two acts by Gioacchino Rossini. The libretto by Gaetano Rossi is based on Voltaire's tragedy Semiramis, which in turn was based on the legend of Semiramis of Assyria. The opera was first performed at Laugh Nietzsche in Venice on 3 February 1823. Semiramide was Rossini's final Italian opera and according to Richard Osborne, could well be dubbed Tancredi revisited. As in Tancredi, Rossi's libretto was based on a Voltaire tragedy. The music took the form of a return to vocal traditions of Rossini's youth, and was a melodrama in which he recreated the Baroque tradition of decorative singing with unparalleled skill. The ensemble scenes and choruses are of a high order, as is the orchestral writing, which makes full use of a large pit. After this splendid work, one of his finest in the genre, Rossini turned his back on Italy and moved to Paris. Apart from Il Viaggio a Reims, which is still in Italian, his last operas were either original compositions in French or extensively reworked adaptations into French of earlier Italian operas. Musicologist Rodolfo Celletti sums up the importance of Semiramide by stating, was the last opera of the great Baroque tradition, the most beautiful, the most imaginative, possibly the most complete, but also, irremediably, the last. Composition History after making his mark with a number of brilliant comic operas, Rossini turned more and more to serious opera. During the years 1813 until 1822 he wrote a considerable series of them, mostly for the Teatro di San Carlo, Naples. One reason for his new interest in the serious genre was his connection with the great dramatic soprano Isabella Colbrun, who was first his mistress, then his wife. She created the leading female roles in Elisabetta, Regina d'Inghilterra, Otello, Armida, Mosinigito, Maometto II, and five other Rossini operas up to and including his final contribution to the genre, Semiramide, which was also written with Colbrun in the major role. Work began with the librettist in October 1822, composer and librettist taking Voltaire's story and making significant changes. Actual composition took Rossini 33 days to complete the score. Performance History 19th century following its premiere, the opera was given 28 times for the rest of the season in Venice, and it went on to presentations throughout Italy and Europe, including Paris in 1825, Milan in 1829 and 1831, and Vienna in 1830. It reached London on 15 July 1824, was given its U.S. premiere at the St. Charles Theatre in New Orleans on 1 May 1837, but it took until 3 January 1845, before it was performed in New York. Other prima donnas emerged in the major roles by about 1825. Since Colburn's vocal powers had greatly diminished by the time of the Venice premiere performances and she was in no state to ever sing the role again. For 25 years after 1830, Julia Greasy triumphed in the role notably in St. Petersburg in 1849 and New York in 1854. By the late 1800s, the opera had virtually disappeared from the repertoire. However, it was chosen in 1880 to inaugurate the Teatro Costanzi, new venue of the Rome Opera Company, and appeared as part of the Cincinnati Opera Festival 1882, which was attended by Oscar Wilde, and which featured the famous diva Adelina Patti who chose the aria, Bel Raggio Lusinghiero, for her farewell performance. The Metropolitan Opera revived Semiramide in 1892, 1894, and 1895, 20th century, and beyond it took until 1932 until the opera was again revived in Rostock, and it then reappeared under Tullio Serafin at the 1940, at the Maggio Musicale Fiorentino. Although the overture is one of several of Rossini's to be widely recorded, the opera is only occasionally performed in modern times. Presentations at La Scala in Milan in December 1962 with Joan Sutherland and Giulietta Simeonato required the reassembly of the entire score from the Rossini autograph since no other texts were known to exist, while musicologist Philip Gossett notes that between 1962 and 1990, some 70 opera houses have included the work in one or more seasons. It was not until the Met 1990 revival after almost 100 years that a production based on a new critical edition was mounted. It starred Lella Kubeli in the title role and Marilyn Horn as Osace. 
In 2004, the opera was mounted in concert form by the Radio Symphony Orchestra, Vienna, and Wiener Konzertka. For recent productions, the database Opera Base notes 22 performances of five productions in five cities since January 2012, but only two of the five were staged productions, the others being concert versions, including one given by the Rossini and Wild Bad Festival in 2012, which was recorded with Alex Penta in a title role. In November 2017, the Royal Opera House, London, mounted its first production of the opera since the 1890s, with Joyce Di Donato in the title role. Synopsis Colon time, antiquity or, some 2000 years before the Christian era, place, Babylon Overture Semiramide has its own overture, which was almost certainly composed last. Unlike many operatic overtures of the day, it borrowed musical ideas from the opera itself thus making it unsuitable for use with another score. The range and balance of musical ideas, from the hushed, rhythmic opening through the andantino for four horns and the repetition with pizzicato counter melodies in the strings to the lively allegro, make the overture to Semiramide one of Rossini's finest contributions to the genre and deservedly one of the most popular. Act 1 Temple of Baal, Babylon the high priest Ro invites Saul to enter the temple, and Babylonians do so carrying offerings to Baal. Asso states that the day has come for the queen to choose a successor and he reminds all of his own valor. Idrino expresses surprise, Edish's aspirations and all express their individual concerns and fears. Semiramide enters to the acclaim of all, but Idrino and Azur individually speculate as to who will be chosen. They pressed the queen to announce her decision, but, at the same time Semiramide herself is fearful about making the decision, especially as she appears to be expecting someone's arrival. Suddenly, the temple is plunged into darkness and there is general consternation amidst fears of its imminent collapse. All desert the temple. Asache, a warrior, enters. He has been told by his dying father to go to the temple in Babylon and he was also urgently sent for by Semiramide. He brings with him a casket belonging to his father, but he is puzzled as to why he has been called back to Babylon. He declares his love for Princess Azama who loves him though she has been promised to the dead King Ninyos lost son, Ninya. Asache states his unwillingness to support Asur in his bid for the throne. Asache asks to see the high priest. Aro enters, opens the casket, and exclaims upon seeing it that it contains the holy relics of the dead king. He hints to Asache about some treachery that had been involved. Seeing Asur approach, Aro leaves with the relics. Asur arrives and questions the reason for Arsace's return. The two men discuss Azama, with Asache reaffirming his love for her while Asur states that he too loves her. You have no idea what love is, the younger man tells the older. The entrance hall of the palace Azama enters, happy that Asache is now in Babylon. Idrino follows her and asks for her hand. She tells him that this must be Semiramide's decision. What of your heart? He asks, assuming that his rival can only be Asur. Scornfully told that it will never be Asur, Idrino is comforted, although he expresses his desire to punish the wicked boldness of a rival, and continues to express desire for Azama. The Hanging Gardens having fallen in love with Asache and believing that he loves her, Semiramide waits for his arrival. She receives a message from the Oracle, telling her that a wedding will make a new king. She believes this to be a sign from the gods that they approve of her plans, and orders preparations for a wedding. When Asache arrives, he alludes to his love for Azama without specifically naming her but he also declares that he will die for his queen if necessary. Semiramide still believes that he really loves her, and vows that she will give him all he desires. They leave separately. The palace throne room all enter to await Semiramide's arrival and her announcement of her choice of successor. Asache, Idrino, Aro, and Asur all swear to obey her command, no matter what she decides. She demands loyalty to the man she chooses, and they are told that he will also be the queen's husband. When Semiramide names Asache as her chosen one, Azur is outraged, and Idrino accepts the decision, but requests Azima's hand, which is granted. After asking Aro to unite Semiramide and Asache, 
Semiramide is horrified by the uproar which emits from the close-by tomb of King Nino. All are horrified as King Nino's ghost appears, warning of the crimes to be expiated, telling Arsace that he will reign and to respect the high priest's wisdom, and commanding him to come down into his tomb. Each character expresses his or her own anguish. Act 2 A hall in the palace in a brief encounter, Maitrain warns the royal guard to keep Azur under surveillance and not to allow him to leave the palace. Then Semiramide enters, followed shortly after by Azur. Conflict between the two soon emerges, she reminds him that it was he who gave the cup of poison to Nino, thus causing his death, and he reminds her that it was she who had prepared it. Who handed me the cup of death? He asks. Recalling that at that time she had a son, Ninia, she speculates that he might have been killed by the same man who killed Nino. Asur continues to pressure Semiramide to make him king. In turn, she threatens to reveal the crime, and they sing an extended duet, recalling the terror and retribution that each could inflict upon the other if the truth came to light. Semiramide continues to demand that Asur acknowledge Asache as his king. Rejoicing is heard in the distance, and while Semiramide regains some of her former happiness, Asur becomes re-signed to his fate. King Ninos Tumaro and the Magi are assembled in the tomb. The high priest urges Arsache to come forward, but makes him aware that there may be some unpleasant news awaiting him. Upon his arrival, Aro tells him that he is Ninia, Ninos' son, who had been saved by Fradate and brought up as his own. Aghast at this news, Asache then learns that Semiramide is his mother. To reinforce this news, Aro hands him a scroll, writing by the king before his death, the reading of which confirms the priest's statements. The final blow comes when Asache reads Ninyos' words, and realizes that his mother and Azur were the ones who killed his father. Azur was the traitor. Almost collapsing in grief into Oro's arms, he asks for comfort but the priests quickly reinforce his need to take immediate revenge. They equip him with armor and a sword and give him the determination to proceed. Sword in hand, Asache leaves Semiramide's apartment Sazamar and Maitrain are alone, the former complaining that she has lost everything now that Asache, the love of her life, is due to marry the queen. Entering, Idrino overhears this and is distraught. Azamar promises him her hand if he so desires it, but he wishes that she would love him. Two choruses of maids, lords, and Indians lead them all to the temple. In the temple Semiramide confronts Arsace, who finally hands her the scroll which has revealed all. Horrified, she then understands Arsace's real identity, and becomes remorseful, offering herself to his revengeful blows. He swears filial loyalty, expressing the wish to spare his mother. Together, they each accept the reality but Asache declares that he must go to his father's tomb, and take whatever action is necessary. Knowing what is in store, Semiramide urges him to, return to me victorious. Adjacent, to Ninos tomb defiantly, Asur enters and proclaims that this will be Arsace's last day on earth. Learning, from his men that the people have turned against him, he still vows to kill Asache. He moves towards the tomb only to find some unknown force, some apparition holding him back. His men urge him on, but still the apparition remains in his mind. His men are puzzled, until he seems to recover and then, with his men beside him, vows to fight on. Along with Aro, Arsace enters the tomb. He awaits his rival. Asur enters, also awaiting Arsace. Semiramide then comes in to pray at Ninyo's tomb, asking for forgiveness and protection. For her son, Arya, Al mio pregatarendi, il filio tuo defendi slash, yield to my prayer, protect your son. In the confusion of the darkness, all three Arsace, Semiramide, and Asur express some bewilderment as to the loss of their courage at this crucial moment. But in the darkness, and seeking to strike Asur, Arsace strikes Semiramide as she steps between them to stop the fight. Surprised to learn Arsace's real identity, Asur is arrested. Semiramide dies, and to general acclaim by the people, Asachoi reluctantly accepts that he shall be king. Brought to you by Wikividi Documentaries. Would you like